Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event. Uh, it's in partnership as last time with IWG PLC. Uh, this event, as many of you know, is what we're calling the e 2 Unfiltered series. Um, at 6.45, we're going to go into breakout rooms. Uh, we're going to split everybody up uh, into these smaller breakout rooms. And the idea is we're in COVID, we can't network. So the idea behind it is to be able to allow people to build relationships and to network together. For those of you that don't know me, um, my name is Shalini Kempka. I'm the founder for my sins of E2E. It's a huge privilege for me today to be in conversation with Kim Morris. She is wearing the beautiful blue shirt. She's right in the center of my screen. If you've got a gallery view, hopefully you can see her blonde hair. Um, she is uh, an award-winning entrepreneur, and that's putting it mildly. She's won a huge number of awards. She's an, she's an investor, she's a philanthropist, she is the co-owner and the co-founder of a business called Ground Control, which is the UK's leading commercial landscaping company. And I'm really intrigued to hear your story, uh, Kim, because who would have thought a landscaping company can go from zero to 125 million turnover in such a short period of time? Um, UK business and the ethos is continuously moving forwards towards a greener, more sustainable culture and entrepreneurs, as I'm proud to say, we are moving with them. Sustainability, green and carbon neutral and climate change are high on the global agenda. Last March, um, during the COVID lockdown, uh, carbon emissions were globally uh, temporarily um, seriously reduced, which was wonderful to see showing that even more strenuously the impact that man and we as human beings are having on our planet. This has fueled the need for much more, um, many more of us to look at carbon neutral uh, environments and to move to carbon neutral environments quickly. Uh, but it's a global effort and it's us working together. And with that global effort, with one person, with one business, we can all make change. Kim Morris, she has turned commercial landscaping into a sexy industry with the wholesomeness of her eth ethical approach and her commitment to sustainability, green investment and her social impact ventures she has also thrown into all of this. Um, she's not only a great example and inspiration to entrepreneurs in the carbon neutral zone, but also a serial entrepreneur and she ha has a great deal of experience uh, and wisdom to impart, which I'm looking forward to hearing later on. So if you're an entrepreneur building, scaling or selling your business, we hope that you'll find the next 80 minutes um, informative, interactive and that you'll be in touch with us to assist you further. Um, today, our E2E ambassadors, are, and they're, they're, that's what we call our members, we'll, we'll be going into the breakout sessions and uh, having online rooms for networking and discussion. We begin that at 6.45 p.m. Uh, we've recently launched, as hopefully many of you know, the premium membership. So thank you to those of you, there's so many of you who've been upgrading to the premium membership from the complimentary. Uh, we're glad to have you join us on that journey. With communities becoming disconnected during the last three lockdowns across the UK, I feel and my team feels it's even more important to encourage entrepreneurs to meet socially, although it's online, and to launch a premium service we felt was really important. So before I take you through this evening's format uh, and our new membership proposal, I'd quickly like to run you through some housekeeping and um, for the reception. So my suggestion is that everyone except the panel, we stay muted for now. And, and please do keep your cameras on if you'd like to. Kim Marsh has kindly agreed to do a keynote talk tonight. And after that, we'll do a quick poll followed by an interactive Q&A. So for the interactive Q&A, uh, I'd suggest if you wouldn't mind, if you look at the bottom right hand side of your Zoom screens, you will see a button called reactions. If you hit on the word reactions, you can raise your hand. And by raising your hand, you can put, put forward and I'll bring you in to interact with Kim and with Richard um, to talk about any of the challenges that you're having and to talk about any questions or observations. If you don't have the reactions button, if you hit participants, you should also be able to raise your hand. So 
please do raise your hand and let's make it really, um, really interactive. So without further ado, I just want to tell you a little bit about E2E, uh, but, and I'd also like to thank, and uh, it's a huge thanks to Richard Morris. He's wearing the, the black shirt. He, um, uh, I hope you can see him. Richard Morris is the chief executive of IWG PLC, and we've been working for the last four years with IWG um, to really build entrepreneurship across the UK um, together. Um, so, before I introduce Rich Morris, quick summary of E2E. Uh, as many of you know, we're all about enabling extraordinary entrepreneurship. I like to briefly describe us as a match.com for business. Um, we're looking to provide access to human capital technology, corporate services, and financial capital. So we provide that by bringing people together. We do a lot of that normally through running phys physical events around the country and through one-to-one -one interactions. Right now, we're doing it in the digital way, which I think is also uh, actually very beneficial in many ways because we're able to expand what we do to services globally. Uh, so we take pride in bringing you guys together. Uh, if you're looking to raise investment, if you're looking to find a non-exec director, if you're looking for access to um, corporate services, including service offices, Richard is going to talk to you about our joint package and our offering together. Uh, all of our, our services um, are available at mates rates and if you're a premium member you have access to around £24,000 of support uh, um, and pretty much at mates rates or at, at a much reduced um, price to the complimentary uh, membership. So um, what I'd like to say is if uh, you would like to get involved if you're not already there is on our website uh, a button called membership. Just click on that one and you'll find out a little bit more. So without further ado, I'd like to um, hand over to Richard. Uh, Richard's going to talk to you about our partnership and then it will be my huge pleasure to introduce Kim Morrish. So uh, Richard, thank you again. And uh, it's a pleasure working with you, Richard. Jalini, uh, thank you very much. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I, I hope you're all very well. Um, I'll just say a few moments or spend a few moments talking a little bit about International Workplace Group and, and then move on to how we work with E2E and the benefits that we provide to E2E ambassadors. Um, on a personal level, you know, I'm, I'm extremely proud uh, that International Workplace Group is a, is a partner and a supporter of E2E. Um, we, we believe that there's a lot of sort of complementary aspects to, to what we do and what we do with our customers uh, and the idea of E2E forming this amazing network of entrepreneurs. Uh, and, you know, we look forward later this year, I guess, Shalini, to getting back on the road and being able to do our events uh, around our network of locations. So a um, little bit about International Workplace Group. Uh, quite simply, we're on the mission to sort of repackage how companies use real estate. And we're doing that by building a global network of on-demand workspace. Uh, today, the network is three and a half thousand locations in 120 countries, spanning 1,500 cities and towns in the UK. Uh, we have around 400 locations covering 100 towns and cities, and most of the population is never more than 20 minutes away from one of our on-demand workplaces. The idea, of course, is that we're meeting changing requirements and changing expectations that companies have now, today, more than ever before for flexibility in where people work from, how people work, and of course, providing the, the workspace in, in high quality, convenient locations to companies to enable them to work where they need to be, when they need to be. We do all of this in a number of different ways. In the simple terms, you can buy a monthly subscription to give you access to our network of workspaces or you can pay as you go, simply download the Regis app onto your smartphone and you'll be able to immediately search for locations wherever you might need them. You can hire a private office by the hour, by the week, by the month or however long you wish, meeting rooms, conference venues, hot desks um, and business lounges as well. So it's really a multi-purpose, multifunctional network of workspaces 
We provide it under a number of different brands. Uh, so we don't actually use the International Workplace Group brand for any of our locations, a little bit like intercontinental hotels, if you want to think of it in that sense. We have brands including Regis, Spaces, Base Point, Clubhouse, HQ, Signature, Central Working, just to name but a few that we operate in the UK. Um, and we look forward to uh, welcoming you uh, as and when uh, you're allowed to escape from the confines of, of your home. It's interesting actually speaking to our customers right now. We think that the pandemic and, and the changes that that has brought about, this forced global experiment in working from home will certainly leave a, a, a long-term lasting impact and, in, and change fundamentally how people work uh, and, and working nearer from home working more from home for sure and using city center offices in ways uh, different to before but everything points to flexibility uh, and the opportunity to to use workspace in a different way our partnership with e2e uh, provides a number of really nice benefits uh, first of all uh, we're providing for the next six months free access to all of our business lounges uh, to E2E members. So that's where you can touch down, uh, get some work done in, it, in a sh shared workspace area. Uh, and we're offering that free uh, on a trial basis to all E2E members. We're also offering three months free uh, on any package, whether that's for a private office or, or a virtual office, a business address three months free uh, on, a, on a minimum uh, six month uh, term agreement. Uh, so that's a fantastic offer as well. Uh, and we're also offering 10% discount only available to E2E uh, members on our meeting room and, and conference room venues, which as I said, you can find very easily by downloading uh, the app. Shalini, I hope I've covered all of our, uh, the benefits that we provide um but over to you thank you richard thank you very much absolutely you did and the one thing i'd like to add is also richard has kindly offered that our members have access to the business lounges um so for the next uh, six months if you wanted to access any of the business lounges if you drop my team a line we will liaise with richard's team to um enable you to do that and i think it's particularly important today because we're obviously in lockdown. As lockdown releases, you might not want to be back in an office, but you might need uh, the lounge environment as a change of place um, from home. So Richard, thank you and thanks for your support. I'm delighted that you're joining us today. Now, it's my huge pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, it's my huge pleasure uh, to formally introduce Kim Morrish. Um, Kim, as I said before, is an award-winning entrepreneur. She's an investor, a philanthropist who puts purpose uh, at the heart of her work. She's the co-owner and the co-founder of Ground Control, along with her husband, Simon. Um, Ground Control is the UK's leading commercial landscaping company who, for which she led the acquisition in 2004. Kim and Simon, they've grown the company from revenues of 8 million to, as I mentioned earlier, to over 125 million. Kim is an experienced serial entrepreneur in scaling businesses and leading transformational change. Um, her current focus is on social impact ventures and green investing, whilst ensuring that Ground Control remains the UK's leading commercial landscaping company and a great place to work. Ground Control offers an array of commercial landscaping services to blue chip clients, including the Tower of London. And Kim, what about IWG? I, I want to speak to Richard about it. That's a great segue. <laughs> Thank you. This Thanks. is what we love. We love connecting. So we hope that you and Richard will stay connected post, yeah. um, post this event. Um, however, as they're, they're always very mindful of defining philosophy and the call for action, their call for action is caring for our environment and supporting the UK journey to be carbon neutral by 2050, which is also the government's agenda. Uh, Kim and her husband have continued to be integral to the success of Ground Control, receiving an outstanding EY Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2018. Um, Kim's passion for nature, and I've seen this through the calls that we've had, her commitment to sustainability and her ethical approach also sets her apart. Ground Control have committed 5%
of their annual net profits to a £5 million impact, fund, uh, impact ventures fund. Uh, it's an evergreen fund dedicated to environmental initiatives and carbon uh, sequester sequesterization. I hope I pronounced that properly. Um, only a few weeks ago, Ground, Ground Control topped the Hawk Week annual list. So congratulations for that, Kim, uh, as, as the top 100 landscapes uh, and maintenance businesses. Um, they also recently won the Highways England Excellence in Environment and Sustainability Award. I'm just mentioning a few. In 2016, uh, Kim founded Canterbury Partners, supplying patient capital to support inspired leaders who generate beneficial social and environmental impact initiatives. She's also a non-exec director of Mustard um, Seed Impact, which offers investment and support for young social businesses and startups with significant sustainability in, in, in addition to great potential. Um, she, in addition to all of that, I learned very recently, is studying at Cambridge on uh, landscaping. So maybe you'll bring that one in as well. How you do that with running a, uh, a 100 million, 125 million pound business, I don't know, but we're gonna find out now. So Kim, um, thank you again for taking the time um, to join us and I hand over to you. Um, thank you so much, Helena. It's great to be here. Uh, that's just, it's a sustainability course at Cambridge, and it is one to have four kids to understand the challenges they experience by doing virtual learning and online learning. It, it is a poor cousin to face-to-face -face education. But I'm halfway finished. I've had to request extensions already a number of times. Um, to get my work in, but it is re it's really proving interesting despite the challenges. Uh, Shalini, I think you've covered a big chunk of what I was going to talk about tonight. Thank you for the build up. Um, when I'm asked to speak about ground control, I generally forget to talk about results and I talk a lot about values driven business. But there is a lot to be proud of. We, we Simon and I and the team scaled the business that we bought in 2004 from 8 million to 125 million and profits are EBITDA from 2 million to 21 million. And it's been an incredibly exciting journey. It's 100% been a team journey. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm thinking about what has motivated me over my life, how do, how do I get to the age I am sitting in Essex and um, owning, owning a landscaping business? I think back to the very beginning, I grew up in a family business. It was second generation, it's now third generation family business my grandparents started. And when you have a, a long-term horizon and family business values, you learn a lot about good ways. I mean, probably the best ways to run a business, which is long-term perspective, really caring about your customers, really caring about your employees, getting heavily involved in communities and civic duty. And so, you know, uh, learning by osmosis, that was my whole life background. My dad had mentioned, why don't I come in and join the business? And I was, I was really interested and excited about driving um, economic social change in emerging markets. So after my MBA, I joined the foreign office. And uh, I worked in some of the most amazingly beautiful and tragic countries in the, in the, in the world in terms of Bolivia, Haiti, Bosnia, right after a huge conflict there in Central Asia. And I was, I was responsible for running microcredit and micro lending projects. And, um, and I absolutely loved it. Very purpose driven. It was the main motivation. I got out of bed every day, so excited about what we were doing. I hit my early thirties and, um, and had a, you know, a new family on the way. And my motivation really changed and it changed from purpose to much more control and money. In the Foreign Service, they send you. And I was working for a, a German firm after that. They, they send you where you need to go. And so my very early entrepreneurial ventures had a, had a very different um, motivation than what I was used to. So uh, Sam and I launched our um, second startup together that we exited with our egos intact. It was in the tech sector, egos intact, some money in the bank, but a real confidence that we worked well together. And then I worked in another startup in Boston when he was doing his MBA. And around that time, we're thinking, what's next? We talked about launching another startup, but three startups uh, under my belt and a growing family. The idea of a business acquisition was a lot more interesting. And we had this, uh, we had this idea. 
buying a business that was already existing was smarter, safer, and faster to achieving the means to what we wanted to do next. So I started the search for the business sum and owed McKinsey a couple of years. They put him through his MBA program. And I started the broadest search you could possibly imagine for a business because it wasn't sector specific. It wasn't even geographic specific. And it was a broad size. It could have been anything over a million to probably 10 million. And uh, we found ground control. And I call that acquisition and our whole mentality around it was our starter home. It was a business that we would grow into and scale. And then we would exit to go do something we really cared about in terms of the purpose. So we closed on that acquisition in 2004. And any business that you buy has definitely got some skeletons. And um, we found some right away on closing and then others um, seeped out later in the journey. But all of you who are entrepreneurs know there's, there's bun bunches of bumps. There's lots of bumps in any business. Um, we hit the hardest bump at 18 months into the business. There were, we were so off on our projections for profit and cash. And um, we had to remortgage our home December to hit Christmas bonuses and payroll. And pretty much the same week, we found out one of the directors who was a shareholder with us, had been in the business for 15 years and was a really close personal friend to all the other directors and the former owner. He was committing pretty widespread fraud. Um, we closed for Christmas trading and uh, we didn't know how deep it went. At least four contracts managers were involved and 13 field teams had been participating in this. And uh, it, was, it was really pretty terrifying time. Um, we came out of that and it was just harder work. We had a plan, we knew it was gonna be hard work. We were gonna run the business to be very, very lean. So when we went to exit in five years, we'd have EBITDA that was was high and sexy and we'd look at a multiple on that. So any, any cost we could shave out, we kept out. Anything we could do to just burn through, to, through harder work, we did. So that huge bump um, was a big disruption to our projection. So it just meant you know working harder. So we hit 2008, this is four and a half years into owning the business and we are on plan. We're back on plan with everything we'd hoped to achieve and we're preparing for the sale of the business. Now, uh, a catalog of cataclysmic events hit us one after the other. The first is fabulous, talented gal we brought in as the new ops director who had invested 200,000 pounds to join us. And he was our succession plan because we imagined private equity would be the most likely buyers. They would want somebody staying in the business. Very, very talented. He had joined and we exited him right before we put the business up for sale because of just the cultural alignment wasn't there. And it was something that was so important to us. Um, soon after that, we lost our biggest contract, which was Tesco. When we bought the business, it was 60% of turnover and 70% of our profits. And with almost no notice in, um, in the late spring of 2008, they canceled our contract. Uh, Within weeks of that happening, the former owner and founder of the business who had become a, a very close and dear personal friend committed suicide. And we are staggering into the beauty pageant, the, or the beauty parade, beauty pageant, into the beauty parade with all these private equity firms to, um, to market the business for sale. And it felt like, you know, a prize fighter. We'd been knocked down over and over and over and we're, we're standing again. We're going through the motions of the sale. And uh, we had three really fantastic offers, um, different pay earnouts and different, uh, different lengths of time that would keep us in the business. And we're trying to decide, it was like picking melons, what, you know, which one was the better offer and Lehman Brothers collapsed and all the offers just evaporated. You know, I, I think you tell a lot about a person from how they react to tough things. Uh, we were, you know, we were devastated. It was tough. And it's not that our plans had been derailed. They had just been shattered. And uh, we took, a, you know, I was licking the wounds and 
there was a couple months we just kept showing up every day and like we finished the run we were out of runway that was the plan and we hadn't thought what we'd do instead of and um and I said let's you know let's get an off-site we had a facilitator come in and work with us and we we just did a reset what uh what do we need to do to go to the next phase and what did that next phase look like and what was really exciting at that moment again we are real we're bruised and bleeding but what was exciting is we with a major recession we don't know when um when we're going to ever be able to sell the business and so let's think on a long-term perspective and it really brought home to me so many of the values of the business i had grown up watching we redefined what the purpose of the business was which wasn't profit maximization to exit it was uh caring for our environment we got the whole team together when we really thought what do we care about and how do we want to move forward so we defined the purpose around environmental sustainability and we did a big splashy campaign all rebranding and then really concrete actions to take green fleet um how we are treating uh, recycling and waste green energy so that was number one. And then we put a new plan together. I mean, if you're going to Manchester or Madrid or the moon, you need a really concrete plan with who, where, when, how. And we widely communicated it. The first business plan that we had was really just with the executive team and the Bank of Scotland, who provided most of the debt on that acquisition. Um, but this one, we, you know, we really dusted it off and, and put an ambitious target of 100 million pounds uh, by 2020, and we called it the 2020 vision. The next thing that we thought about is people. We'd been running really lean with who, who we had inherited when we bought the business. And we thought about who, who are the types of people we need to bring on board. Big push for bringing in the very most talented people we could finally, you know, we, we could find. Um, and then how do we keep them aligned in the, in the journey that we want to take? Uh, Simon is a systems engineer. We had pretty robust systems. We introduced all new IT and, um, and scheduling into the business. But what we did here is a systems driven approach to everything that we did. And that was a big investment. And it's the only way to dramatically scale a business is when you have the right systems driven by the, the right people. Um, you can't grow without capital. That was part of the plan. Uh, you can't build your house one room at a time. We had a very aspirational ambition. So we needed to figure out all the ways we were going to finance that. And finally, culture. So Simon had put a very um, you know, sticky fingerprints all over the business when we came in. We structured a business where everyone at the senior team had mortgaged their homes to invest alongside with us. We offered the opportunity for anyone getting a bonus to use the bonus instead to buy shares in the business. And we gave every employee share options that would vest after three years. And at the time, not only did no one you know, probably trust that the share options would be worth very much, they didn't even understand them. And we were so committed to team approach and shared uh, wealth creation. Um, and that had always been that social sustainability part, always been a really important part of the business, but we embedded a, a number of other values into the business at that time. And for me, it was a lot around not only profit, but people and planet. So the tagline of caring for our environment that was our purpose, but also putting our people at the center of everything that we do. Now, I truly believe that has been the foundation of our success. So there's lots of things that contribute to success, but the foundation was getting that culture right. We got it halfway right when we acquired the business um, on the social sustainability side, but we, I think, got it fully, you know, as much as you can get anything right. We really honed it in and got it right when we kind of relaunched the business at the end of 2008. Um, I had I had been on tenders. I used to run all of our business development for for years, and every tender that we ever won was based on price. And our customers would call it value for money. We used to call it that, but it was only we were only ever competing on price. We retained, and we have tremendous retention rates. You know, pick a number, ninety six to ninety nine percent, depending on what you're measuring. Um, but we retained on service. And I can't share with you how uh, how wonderful it was the end of last year to be on a pitch again. First of all, just to be on a pitch because I love I love meeting with customers. 
but where the whole presentation was based on our values and our culture. And we talked about our social sustainability, everything from living wages to big investment and in, in people and training and learning and development to the, um, the share ownership that every employee is also a shareholder. And then we talked passionately about our commitment to the environment. And the last couple of years, I've really raised the volume on that. It was for a long time, it was always people, 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 and um, taking care of our people. And increasingly, it's more on, on, the, um, on the environment. Now, we didn't set out to build a purpose-driven business, but we certainly have one now. And uh, purpose isn't black and white. It's something very personal to anyone who's talking about it, but it is something that you, that you live. And uh, Shalini already mentioned that we achieved carbon neutrality. Um, we announced it on Monday of this week, and that is smashing the target we set for ourselves by five full years. So it's something that, you know, I really applaud everyone in the business that's put in the hard miles to get there. And um, there's so there's so much, you know, Shalini pointed out, there's so much focus right now on sustainability and the environment. Um, and I find there's a lot of greenwashing. Uh, we, we see in the news every day how many millions of trees are pledged, what's the commitment for carbon zero, commitments for this, commitment for that. What we really desperately need are science-based targets and evidence-based results. And we're not going to make the change that we want to see, and we're not going to be the change we want to be without really focusing on those hard tasks and not just talking about, you know, what we want to, what we want and hope to do. So um, I'm going to close with, uh, with a question I've been asked a lot because uh, 2019, I announced that we were launching within the business, a fund that would invest in sustainable ventures along with an earmark for planting trees, 100,000 pounds every year for woodland creation, so you could sequester carbon. And um, we announced that in 2019, we get to 2020, and gosh, it's like 2008 revisited, lots of things were going wrong at the same time. And we're looking down the, the barrel of a gun, like every business in the world, on huge disruption to our operations, major reduction in our revenue, um, closing uh, closure of offices and tremendous uncertainty. And at the board meeting, someone asked, you know, what should we do? Because we're saying we're gonna channel all this profit into risky ventures uh, for sustainability when we don't know how it's gonna affect the business. Um, and all of our employees are shareholders. We have a really big duty to care for them. And I love this expression or this saying, it is never the wrong time to do the right thing. And that was my response. And I was so delighted the board was 100% aligned that irrespective of the, the confusion, the uncertainty and um, the turmoil that we would carry on with what we say we're gonna do. If you're driving a values led business, you can't just get in the passenger seat, get in the back or, or pull over. You have to keep focused on the things that you say you care about and that you're committed to. So the year has been good for us overall, um, but I think that has been a really important emotional connection with our workforce, I mentioned our customers because we we won, we were awarded a multi-million pound contract on the back of that tender. Um, and also our supply base, that there's something bigger beyond just surviving or making money, that it's something that we can all get around and, and care about. So that is my story. I think I've mostly hit it right on time and I would love to hear any questions from the audience. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna ask you to, you can always raise your hand like this. I can see if I can see you. Otherwise, um, use the reactions button or the participants button, um, please, to uh, ask questions. So um, I'm going to kick off with uh, Avnish, uh, Avnish Goyal and then Robert Kilgour, if I may. Avnish, great to see you. Avnish is uh, on our advisory board. Um, and then I'll go to Robert Kilgour and I'd like to bring in uh, Martin Liu as well. Avnish? You're on mute. It's on mute because she's there. Uh... Can you say unmute Anita? Uh, hang on. 
So we're on uh, speakerphone, so there's two of us together. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Shalini, for that. And, uh, and Kim, um, thank you for that incredible uh, uh, presentation and talk. Very, very inspiring. Um, you you may, may or may not know, but actually you are our neighbours. Um, I do know. Because, yeah, you're actually our landlords as well. So um, can you put the, I'm going to put the volume up here, actually, sorry. There you go. Uh, can you turn the yours? So we're trying to be together, we're both, both in the same room. room. You're mute. That's it. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, we're neighbours. You're our, our landlord. Uh, we do lots and lots of, uh, you do all our care home uh, garden designs. And uh, you're actually going to be starting our garden very shortly, actually. So, um, and we see your Teslas parked outside uh, the office. So I can vouch for all of the credentials. In fact, my uh, uh, development director just texted me because I said you were on, a, on this call. He said you'd won the, uh, the uh, zero, you've done the zero emissions thing uh, that you mentioned earlier. Sorry, I don't know the exact terminology, but you're, uh, you guys are very big into that. So, uh, so it's incredible that uh, we haven't really, I think we might have met the Tower of London uh, a couple of years ago. <laughs> Uh, that uh, event that you did, but we never really connected. So we're neighbors, we, we're in Essex as well. Um, so it's incredible kind of the, the things that uh, you shared about your, your journey, about the impact of running a business and the, res the responsibility that you have um, and how that's shaping you and shaped you over that time. How you, it was about how you make money and now you see the, the bigger picture. So first of all, I just want to say thank you for sharing all that because one of the things I see for me, and I'm sorry, I will ask a question at the end of this, is that we need people like yourself to say these things because when I'm trying to do the things that I want to do, if there aren't enough people out there doing the same stuff, it's very difficult to get your shareholders to agree to this kind of stuff because there, isn't, there aren't enough people out there. And it's like, well, why do you want to do this? Why are you crazy? Why, you know, that's going to cost this. It's going to, you know, wh where's the payback and, and so on? Who's done it before you? So having... Uh, role models and uh, ambassadors of you know the environment and giving back ma makes a huge difference to me so you actually put fuel in my uh, fire in, in terms of doing more so obviously I'd love to connect with you after this bearing in mind that uh, we're neighbors as well so um, and uh, in, in terms of a question um, you know um, I suppose what advice would you give uh, businesses in terms of why should they do this what's the value to you personally from a, um, you know, like, you know, because most people, they think about business, think about making money, right? But you've turned that far into a far bigger uh, picture. For, for you personally, what do you get from it that is priceless? Gosh, that's a great question. Um, it's, I think it's like in anything in life, it, you can take all the shortcuts, but they catch you out. So whether, you know, whether it's your house and you use your cheapest materials and you mistreat the labor or anybody that's there to support that construction project. And at the end, what you have is not actually worth having. When you build something where you really think about creating something of tremendous value and that's gonna be sustainable, I think as an entrepreneur, all of us want to create something that's gonna last you have to think about the sustainability of it. And, and, and it's, it's not only how you're running the business, it's the social sustainability, how you're treating your people and how you treat your customers and how you treat your whole supply chain. And then the environmental sustainability. Well, we've seen it with COVID. The planet's really interconnected and we don't take care of, uh, of, of the planet around us. The species that's going to be most devastatedly affected is, at, you know, we talk about save the planet. It's kind of like save yourself. And, and the science behind it is it's terrifying and it's irrefutable when you look at the science it's happening. And so I think um, the call to action for, for societies and nations all over the world in response to COVID, I was blown away that you can get, you could get that much energy behind trying to solve a problem. And if we could just do the same with climate change. I think it would be a wonderful thing. Thank you very much. May I move over to Robert thank Kilgower you. now? Avnish, wonderful to see you and Anita. Um, thank you for asking the question. So, Kim, um, uh, Avnish is on our advisory board. Anita and Avnish, they're investors in E2E, so it's such a small world. 
And Robert Kilgara is also on our advisory board and an investor in E2E. Robert, fab fabulous to see you again. Yeah, great to see you, uh, Shalini. You can hear me all right, can you? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, and thank you, Kim, for uh, um, uh, that excellent talk and, and quite a roller coaster journey that, uh, that you've had. Um, it's very impressive. Um, uh, but you, you, you just have to keep going. My father was an entrepreneur, and, and when he saw that I had interests in that direction as a teenager, there were a few things he said to me sort of work hard, play hard, and always remember to put something back along the way, along the journey. And that life isn't a dress rehearsal, this is it. So make the most of um, the time you have and that also never be afraid to surround yourself with people cleverer than you. And that's certainly something, these are things that I've, I, I've took very much to heart um, and have tried to live by and, and work by in, in my 40 years as an entrepreneur. But my question is, with the last year that we've all had, what are the positive lessons and experiences that you've taken out of the COVID journey that you've been on um, uh, in the last uh, 12 months as we move forward into the new normal? Um, that's a great question, Robert. I think when you focus on values-led business, then the answers are clear when you're facing a, a crisis or a catastrophe or even a commercial decision, whatever it is. If you if you set the right, um, you know, the right marching tune, and it's really clear what what do we stand for, what is the what do what do we care about, how do we behave, then when something happens, everybody's moving in the in the same direction already. The, the team at Ground Control did a phenomenal job. I, I have bragged about the team and certainly not bragging on myself at all. The, the executive team did an outstanding job, first and foremost, caring for our people, really being true to that. And secondly, staying so in touch and communicating and making sure everybody was okay. Um, so that was, in, what's, what's our mantra? Caring for our people. We put people at the center of everything we do. And the second one is caring for our environment. And you know, staying true to the, the Evergreen Fund. So I don't know, what, what, what do we end up doing? We've come out of the year fine. We work outside, so that was a huge plus. We can work safely outside. But I think um, that culture and the, the amount we've invested in creating that culture just paid dividends for us as a business. So all the work that you did up to that point has, if you like, had a real live... Um, uh, extreme test the last 12 months and it's 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 come good if you like yes I mean you mentioned your father I think your father and my father must be friends because these are all the exact <laughs> same things I've heard as well they're really important but not all kids hear them and yeah. uh, I'm reminded so what looking back at the business what happened I think when you really help impart values really important values then that's the best thing you can do as a business leader and then yeah. if you if you hire smart and capable people, they'll figure out all the rest, probably in a better way than you would have yourself. Yeah, it's not being afraid to have cleverer people than you around you, which was something which um, he, he drummed into me as well. A lot of entrepreneurs don't like being surrounded by clever people. I don't have that problem. I, I'm, I'm, I love being surrounded by clever people. So um, I'm married to one, so it's, it helps. So thank you, Kim. <laughs> They say behind every strong man, there's usually a stronger woman, Robert. So yep. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for sharing that wonderful question that you posed. I'm going to go over quickly, if I may, to my friend who I discovered recently is also the chairman of um, Ground Control. Um, so Martin, can I ask you, why did you choose to chair the business? And um, a little bit of insights on your thoughts as a, as a chairman. Well, well, you've all just met Kim, so why wouldn't you? Um, I think uh, Kim and I met four or five years ago, and um, we had so many shared experiences and values, it was extraordinary. So we started off investing in another company together. Um, I had spent uh, 10 years up until uh, 2011 uh, building a very successful software company where 
Um, it, everything that Kim said, uh, we were doing in terms of getting the foundations right around the, uh, the, the values, being really clear about our key competences. And I think from a, a business point of view, the question about why do the right thing, if you look at it purely clinically, your biggest leakage of value in any business is when you have high turnover of employees and you lose skills, or you have high turnover of uh, your customers and you don't have high customer retention. So when I sold out in 2011 and looked at what I wanted to do next, for me, it was all about how can businesses have a true purpose and do well by, by doing good. So when Kim and I met, I was already on that, that journey uh, and having built a business to the size of ground control previously, whichever way you want to look at it, I was really keen to work in partnership with Kim and Simon and the team to take it to the next stage because the roller coaster that Kim described up until now, uh, um, you need to have a, 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 a sort of roadmap, a route map to take it to double the size uh, it is now, which is what our, our plan is. Uh, and as Kim said, you know, we focused on the why. Why do we do what we do, which is clearly about safe environments. How we're doing it is a combination of technology and people. Uh, and as I said, I, I spent quite a long while running tech companies. What we do is we look after environments, whether that's cutting the grass, yeah, uh, looking after the trees, helping with pre preventing flooding, uh, uh, and then clearing up afterwards. So we've really started with the why and then focused on the how. So uh, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're very aligned. Well, well, there's one thing I want to say about Martin. I've known Martin for 10 years nearly now. And the thing that he's taught me is growth for good. His whole, when I was um, looking at raising investment for E2E, he was always saying to me, what are you doing for the good? What are you doing for the better purpose? So, Kim, it doesn't surprise me at all that you guys uh, um, got together and uh, that he decided to work with you and vice versa. So, uh, Martin, thank you for sharing that. We've got thank one more question. If I, We've only got time for one more question from Alpa, and then I'm quickly going to do the poll, and then uh, we're going to break up into the, um, um, the, the breakout sessions. So, Alpa, great to see you. Great to see you too, Shalini. Um, Kim, really inspired and um, a fascinating talk. I spend most of my time as a restructuring professional, stopping directors from putting their hands in their pockets. And I was really intrigued when you said that you, you, you were prepared to take out and put your own personal money in. That must have been a really daunting um, decision because you could have lost so much. And I just wondered if you could just reflect on that sort of decision-making process. and. Would you do it again? Would you recommend others to do it? I know it's always that entrepreneurs um, are in their belly. They just want to keep going and strive to do best for all. But obviously there's lots of risk implications involved. And I just wanted to dwell a bit more on that. I, I remember sailing when I was heavily pregnant with our first baby and our then business partner, um, this is the first startup summit I had together, said to, he was really scared. And he's like, oh my God, we're so far, we're so deep. And he's like, it's someone said, it's been deep for a half an hour. You're not gonna drown. You're no more likely of drowning now than you were a half an hour ago. And I think, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, we were already so committed to this business. We had already put everything. I mean, there's another, there's another um, participant on the call, Dimitri Sapos. He was one of our early investors. We had to pass the hat to our friends to get the, the, the deal over the line. We were incredibly leveraged. To have to go and borrow some more, like it was all at stake. It, it felt I felt like we were in Las Vegas at that point. Um, I do think when you commit, you fully commit. And as entrepreneurs, all of you must have the same feeling. Uh, the, I don't think it has to be as scary as some of the things we've went we've gone through, and possibly that was because of the degree of leverage. Um, I'm not sure, but no. Did we hesitate? No. <laughs> <laughs> How could you not pay Christmas bonuses? I mean, that's the other thing is just as a, as a woman and a, and a mom, I just think I would have, I cannot imagine not, not doing that. So no, there was no hesitation. Did you do it again? Um, would I buy ground control again? Exactly, exactly as we did. The change I would make is um, 
we bought ground control as a starter home. So then when we could take the profits and then do businesses we really cared passionately about. So that's why it didn't matter what business we bought. It was kind of to get into the ladder. It was try to build a reputation and then the next business could be something um, heartfelt. Uh, ha I, we could have realized early on that you could make the business anything you wanted, that we could have incorporated so many of these values from day one. But like anything, if you get there in the end, that's great. So I, I feel really delighted that we've gotten there in the end. Excellent. Best of luck going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alpha. Thank you. Uh, Kim, I want to say a huge thank you to you. Um, you absolutely incredible insights today. There's been quite a lot of chat and uh, people are sending me WhatsApps to say, how can we meet you? Um, so obviously they want to follow up. So I can't thank you enough. I think we've all learned a huge amount. I want to thank Richard Morris as well. And we're going to come back to do a closing after the breakout sessions. So please do stay with us. Um, I'd encourage everyone to put your cameras on now. So what's going to happen now is, um, um, my, my colleague Fareed, he is going to press a button and everyone will automatically be put into a breakout room. Please could you select someone to be the moderator? So pick someone really, really quickly. And then if I could ask the moderator just to take a few notes around the main points of discussion. Um, I suggest that everyone introduces themselves again very fast, your name, your company. Talk about one challenge that's affecting you. And then the moderator should pick the challenge in your breakout group that's kind of more consistent across everyone if there is one or you, you mutually pick one together we do a bit of a brainstorming uh in your group around that challenge and if you've got time for two do two and we find that that really is helpful um, in terms of helping people with their business challenges and then five minutes before the closing we'll all come back in just to to uh, um, get together again and uh, for me to to close the the evening so i think we're going to hit a button now so don't forget to choose the moderator and um, if the moderator wouldn't mind i'm, just I'm going to interrupt off. just briefly just before okay. we go into that i do need to run a very very quick poll so oh, forgive me everyone you. but i'm just going to launch a very quick poll if you could just look at the options pick one really quickly 10 seconds yeah. and then we can move into the breakout room so just bear with me i'm launching it now I think the panelists might not be able to answer these questions. I'm, I'm okay. not sure. Kim, have a go, see if you can. I don't think you'll be able to, but everyone else should be. We'd really appreciate it. Just take two minutes. And um, I, what we'd also like to know is if there's something we've not covered, um, please do drop me or any of the team a, an email to say, actually, you're looking for this kind of support and we will try and um, see how we can help. So the next question, will it, it uh, it goes through, so. Shall I start to share Great. the results? So, so I think um, lots of people have already answered some of the questions. Just give them another 10 seconds and then we'll wrap up. And I then I'll, I'll just say the results Tune quickly. for Jeopardy here. Let's, let's go. Okay. Alrighty. So, so I'm gonna the end the poll in four, three, two, one. Thank you. Can I share the results, Farid, now? Okay, so in terms of challenges. You, you can. Um, okay, currently my main challenge. So we've got the most is none of the above. So please, can you write to us? If you put none of the above, please write to us to say what it is that is your challenge. If you don't have any, that's great, but I'm, I'd be surprised. Um, number two, uh, I want access to discounted physical and virtual offices. 17% said yes, 83% um, said no. That will hopefully change in um, COVID, after COVID lockdown. Number three, what is the, um, will the recent UK budget have a positive or negative impact on your business? Uh, oh, that's quite interesting. So 50% um, have said yes, it's a positive uh, uh, impact on their, their business. Uh, what aspect of the recent budget will have the biggest impact on your business? So we have 50% saying the extension of the furlough program and 50% saying the increase in corporation tax um, for uh, up to 25% for larger businesses from 2023. Uh, I would benefit from lead generation, it seems to be the number one choice here, or the none of the above, they're equal. Please. You've gone up, so if I were to sell, would I buy again?
we got everybody coming back in. Uh, all the breakout rooms are going to close in 30 seconds. So we'll get everybody back here and then we'll start to wrap up. Um, hope you guys had good conversations in your rooms. Hey, Amanda. Having, I've got to shoot. I'm already got a, uh, I'm, I'm half in, a, in another Zoom call. Very nice, very, very nice to meet you again. Great to see Keep you as well. Up. Take it easy. Bye. Bye. Hey, Jayesh. Hi, Eunice. How are you guys? Thanks. You? You all right? Oh, very well. That was an incredible talk by Kim. Very well. Yeah, very, very interesting. Hey, yeah. Complete. Amazing. Hey, Kim. So we're, we're, we're still going on about you. <laughs> yeah, we were just saying. Amazing. How brilliant you are. <laughs> That's absolutely inspiring. Uh, okay, so I think we've got everybody back now. So um, let me just find Shalini here. There we are. And Shalini, it's over to you again. You're on mute, by the way. I'm unmuting myself. Can you Great. all hear me? Yes, we can. Can I just yeah. say thank you? I hope, um, I'm sorry, I know people were moving around a little bit. We're getting used to um, setting up the Zoom rooms. It's a new style that we're doing. Um, but I hope that you enjoyed the smaller breakout session. Uh, I know that I did because we talked about values and culture. I'm going to share something with you, which is Nathan Hill's five principles of business, uh, which is do great things, have fun, make a decent living, enjoy working uh, with your colleagues and have a decent work-life balance. So on that note, I want to say a massive thank you to um, Kim Morrish. Um, Kim, I think everyone said, I think we need a round of applause somehow like this to say thank you very much for wow. an amazing session with you. And, uh, and also a huge thank you to uh, IWG, to Richard Morris. Uh, I think he wasn't able to stay on, but um, without their support, these guys are really supporting entrepreneurship and changing the way they work. Um, so thank you to you all. Enjoy your evenings. Our next big event is uh, on the 30th of March with a gentleman called Will Page. Uh, he's the former uh, economist for Spotify. On the 1st of April, on April Fool's Day, he's launching his new book called Tarzan Economics. And uh, he's being interviewed by a friend of mine called Ralph Simon, who is one of the pioneers of the music industry. Um, so uh, I hope you'll join us for that. And in between, I noticed a lot of people said that uh, it was none of the above services. Tell us what you need. Please write to us so we can keep reinvigorating and reinventing ourselves to service the needs of founders. Um, so, uh, and uh, um, uh, I hope that we can keep continuing to add value. Anyway, so thank you very much, everyone, and in enjoy your night. And um, Fareed, thank you to you as well for, and my whole team for, every, uh, for all of your hard work for tonight. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Kim. It was great. All right. Bye. Good night.